there are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Bayless Conley. Hello friend, welcome to the broadcast today. I am so glad that you have joined us and I think that you're gonna be blessed by what you hear today. I think you're gonna find some things in what we say that you can actually apply practically to your life. And as we begin, we're gonna be talking about, you know, how to discern right from wrong. You know, in, in the book of Proverbs written by Solomon thousands of years ago, he had a little nugget of wisdom. He said, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. Well, the question is, if there's a way that looks right, but is not right, how do you find out? We're gonna be talking about that. Stay tuned. Here's Bayless Conley with part two of his continuing message from last week. I remember uh, when I was an assistant pastor, there was a young lady in church, a single mom. She'd gotten saved and just was, was I mean, all out for Christ. And she'd lived a pretty wild and woolly life before she got saved. And I still remember something she said to me one day. She said, Bayless, you know, I never, ever got sick until I got saved and found out that I could get healed. That always stuck with me. I was never sick until I found out I could get healed. Well, sometimes the devil is responsible for that. Here's another one, number five, false doctrine. Getting people off track. If you want to reference 2 Timothy 2, verses 24 to verse 26, there are some evil spirits that specialize in propagating false doctrine. You'll find out more about this in the coming months, but we're going to be working with a, an indigenous group in the mountains of Mexico that do not have the scriptures in their heart language. Now, consequently, a, a cult group has come into their, their community and established themselves that are denying the divinity of Christ saying that Christ is not the Son of God, and they're actually having a very negative impact on the community. Well, we want to give them the Scriptures. We want to give them the Word of God, because that is the cure for that. But the devil will do all he can to get people off track. Here's one we can all relate to, worry. You know, 1 Peter 5, verses 6 through 8 says, Cast all your care on God, for He cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. It directly ties worry to the devil and his devices. Now worry comes to us all. What we do about it, that's what makes the difference. But some people, and they are world champion warriors. They worry about their kids, they worry about their spouse, they worry about their health, they worry about the government, they worry about the future, they worry about their money, worry, 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 worry. And again, the devil just fan the flame and gets you, worry more, worry more, who knows what's going to happen. Shh. <laughs> Jesus said in Mark chapter 4 that anxieties and worries were some of the tools that the devil brings to choke the word of God out of a person's life. Cast your care on God. Give your worries to God. Don't let worry choke the fruitfulness of God's word out of your life. And then here's one I felt that I should add to the list. Betrayal and the brokenness that results from it. John 13 and 2, it says, Satan put it into the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. My friend, the spirit realm is real and the devil will do all he can to thwart or hinder the advance of God's kingdom, be it in a country, in a community, in a church, or in an individual's life. I remember the first time that uh, I went to get a conditional use permit for a building we wanted to use in Orange County. And uh, I went to the uh, office of, of that, that, that city and told the secretary, said, I'm here to, to find out about, you know, getting a conditional use permit in the process and filing for that. And she says, okay, we'll come back here. She took me back to the city manager's office. City manager sitting there with the city attorney. They said, hi, can we help you? I said, yeah. I said, I'm a pastor and I, I came to find out about getting a conditional use permit, 
you know, for such and such building. I said, we've already talked to the owner. The building has been empty and she would love to, to rent it to us. But I understand we have to have a CUP in order to use the building. So I wanted to find out about that. And the city attorney looked at the city manager and they both broke out in laughter. And they looked at me and said, it ain't happening. And then they showed me the door. It was beyond rude. They just laughed at me, sent me on my way and wouldn't even talk to me. I was humiliated, I was embarrassed, I was angry. And you know, I got to praying about it after I left and I just really felt that, that it was spiritual in nature because I mean, it, it wasn't even rational the way they dealt with me. There was no kindness in it at all. It was just, just arrogant and basically threw me out of my ear. And I prayed about it for several days and God gave me a verse from the book of Romans when I was praying. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And I felt like God said, you need to go back, but you need to go in an opposite spirit. Overcome evil with good. You need to go in a spirit of humility. Oh, I didn't want to. I wanted to go back and demand my rights and, and you know, make a big stink about things and show them how angry I was and that, you know, I could hold my own, but I just felt like God said, no, you go in a spirit of humility. So I said, okay. And I went back and I, I meet a guy when I'm coming in and says, hi, you know, can I help you? I said, well, I'm here to find out if I've gotten a conditional use permit. I was here a few days ago. He said, you were. He says, I didn't see you. He said, I'm the mayor. I said, well, nice to meet you. And he said, what happened the other day? And I told him, he said, they laughed at you? I said, yes, sir, they did. He said, come with me. He takes me back into the city manager's office, calls the city attorney over, says, I understand this young man came in to find out about getting a conditional use permit and you guys laughed at him. Man, they were thunderstruck. Neither of them said a word. They said, this young man wants to start a church in our town, help him get his conditional use permit. And they did, and it was shortly thereafter we were able to get it. But, you know, my, my point is, I am quite convinced there were spiritual forces at work behind the scene that didn't want the church established in the town. And if we're going to be victorious in this spiritual battle, here's some thoughts that will help. Number one, know that you are in a battle. Some people's like, oh man, everything's going on. Everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. All this stuff and this weird pressure on my mind. It's almost like I'm under attack or something. You are. <laughs> Number two, realize that ultimately the battle is not against flesh and blood. Paul said we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. Those are actually designations that he uses for different ranks of evil spirits. Some of his favorite words to describe the dark side of the spiritual realm. Listen, your enemy is not your husband. You may be really mad at him, but you're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Your, your enemy is not those children that have broken your heart. It's not your boss. It's not your, it's not your, it's not your mother-in-law. <laughs> we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Number three, you need to know how to stand because dark days do come to us all. Look in verse 14, he said, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth or having on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. All right, number one, stand therefore, have the belt of truth on. Jesus said in John 17 and 17, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. Know the word of God. Listen, the Christian that doesn't know the word is like a baby in a battlefield totally dependent upon others for protection. That's why Peter says in 1 Peter 2 and 2, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. It is not God's will that any of us stay in a state of spiritual infancy, but you will if you don't get into the word of God. You know, I remember I used to teach a Bible study years before we started the church and a skinny kid started coming. He was about maybe 6'3". He was a beanpole. He might have weighed 140 pounds. 
And, you know, he was there faithfully. I actually left for a couple years, came back, and this skinny kid had put on 100 pounds. And it was all muscle. He'd become a fanatic, you know, workout freak. And he, I'll tell you, he was a specimen. And I was talking to him one day. I said, what kind of diet do you have? He said, Bayless, I drink two gallons of milk every day. I said, you do not. He said, yes, I do. Two gallons of milk every day. And I work out twice a day. Now, there's probably better ways to get your protein than drinking two gallons of milk a day. But it makes me think of this verse, desire the pure milk of the word that you might grow thereby. If you'll feed on the milk of God's word and exercise your spiritual muscles, the devil will think twice before he tangles with you next time. Mm. All right, the next thing he said is breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate covers our whole chest area. If we're not established in righteousness, it leaves a huge area of our lives exposed to attack. And the devil will always exploit it. He'll always whisper, you're not worthy. You're not worthy to be loved. You're not worthy to be blessed. Yeah, there are people in the church, but not you. You're not worthy to have your prayers answered. Someone says, well, doesn't the Bible say that our righteousness is as filthy rags? Well, actually, Isaiah did say that in the 64th chapter. But in talking about what Christ would accomplish for us through redemption, Isaiah said this in chapter 61 and 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of his righteousness. Jesus took my filthy rags and gave me his righteous robe. It's called the great exchange. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Verse 21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Friend, at Calvary, Jesus took the filthy rags of my righteousness upon himself, and he gave me his righteous robe. It's hard to get your mind around, and it's, it's not about your merits. It's not about anything you've done. It's about what Christ has done for you. You know, I love our grandkids. I love having them around the house. I love hearing them laugh. I love having meals with them. Despite the fact that sometimes they're slightly naughty, I love them. <laughs> that is the palest, almost insignificant comparison to how much the Father desires me. He wants me in His presence. He loves me. He wants to bless me. Not because I've been good, but because I am his son and I have been made righteous with the blood of Jesus Christ. Romans 5 says it's a gift that we receive. And then verse 15, he said, And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I think among other things, it means we need to always be prepared to share the good news. And think about it in context. Even when you're in the midst of a battle, be prepared to share the good news. The most beautiful feet I have ever seen in my life were clad in cowboy boots, and they belonged to a 12-year-old boy. He was the first person in my life to ever share Christ with me. Came up to me in a park and told me about Jesus. Let me tell you, those feet are beautiful to me. Those feet brought the message of peace, that I can have peace with God and that I can know the peace of God. And I think we always need to be prepared because this world that's at enmity with God, they need to be reconciled to Him. And people that are so disturbed and so distracted, they need to know the peace of God. And friend, we are the carriers of that message. Let us never be so embroiled in our own difficulties that we forget we are ambassadors for Christ. We are good soldiers for Christ, and we always need to be prepared to share regardless of what might be going on. In verse 16, he said, Above all, 
taking the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. The way to have faith in God is to have faith in his word. Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know, Janet and I went fishing up in Alaska not too long ago. I brought back a couple big styrofoam boxes full of salmon fillets and halibut fillets. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but rather than chucking the box out, boxes out, I had an idea, and I got duct tape, and I taped them together, and then I got a big black marker, and I drew a fish, and I drew a water buffalo, and I drew balloons and a star and a lightning bolt, and I gave each one a different numerical designation. And then I called up the grandsons. I said, boys... Papa has a new dartboard for you. You need to come over. <laughs> Set it up in the garage. Those boys have spent countless hours throwing darts at that dartboard. Well, I'm going to get that water buffalo. I'm going for the fish. I'm going for the balloon. Well, you know, the devil may throw a dart at your marriage. He may throw a dart at your children. He may throw a dart at your finances or at your emotions. Anytime he does that, you just need to hold up the shield of faith. Hold up the promise that you're trusting. Put that promise out in front of you. It will quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And the next verse says, In taking the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Let me just comment on this helmet of salvation. You know, the helmet covers the head, covers your mind. You need to just settle it once and for all, whether you're saved or you're not. If you're not, you need to get saved and just become established in it. Because the devil, if he can succeed in planting a doubt in your mind regarding your salvation, he will cripple you as far as any spiritual activity in your life or usefulness for the kingdom. And that's the first thing the devil does when a person comes to faith in Christ. He tries to get them to doubt their experience. Think about it. When the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness, what's the first thing the devil did? He said, well, if you're the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And the devil's right there to whisper in somebody's ear, well, if you were really saved, you wouldn't be having these kind of thoughts. If God really did love you, why would he allow these things to happen to you? And he always tries to insert a doubt in a person's mind. You know, I've had that helmet on for 40 years. Never once since I gave my life to Christ in that little street mission, never one time have I doubted my salvation. And you just need to settle it. If you're not saved, get saved and then keep your helmet on. And then he says, in taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and when he uses the word for Word of God there, it's a, it's a, more, it's a bit of a more rare word. I mentioned Logos before. That's a general knowledge of the Word, the, the, the collective Word of God. But the word he uses here is Rhema. Sword of the Spirit, which is the Rhema of God. It literally means the Word of God that is spoken. And specifically, it's that Word that the Holy Spirit gives you in a particular moment to deal with a specific situation that you speak out. And when you speak it out, it works like a sword. Think about Jesus again in the wilderness. Satan says, well, if you're the son of God, command these stones be made bread. What does Jesus do? He says, get away from me, devil, get away. I'm not going to listen. La, 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 la. Nah. What did Jesus do? He said, it is written. And he quoted scripture. Je devil changes tactic. He says, look, throw yourself down from the temple. For it is written, and then the devil quotes a scripture out of context, a half of a verse. What does Jesus do? Jesus said, it is written. And he quotes scripture again. Then the devil says, all right, I know why you're here. Look, at here's the kingdoms of the world. They've all been delivered to me. That's what you're here for, right? You're here to win these things. Let's take a shortcut. I'll give them to you. Just bow down and worship me. What does Jesus do? He said, no, it is written. And he quotes scripture again. He was using the word as a sword. It only becomes an offensive weapon in our behalf when we speak it out. In Revelation 1.16, we have a picture of Christ. And it says, out of his mouth comes a sharp, two-edged sword. 
It only works as a sword when you speak it. But again, let's go back to that belt of truth. That's what holds the sword. But if you don't take time to get to know the Word of God, the Holy Spirit will have nothing to give you in that critical moment. In the evil day when the forces of darkness are attacking you, if you've not spent any time in the Word, there won't be anything to draw. It is so important that we become people of the book. And then when we are in that critical moment, the Spirit of God will give us that word that we can speak forth and it becomes a sword. And I love it. You know, after Jesus finished with the devil, it said Satan left him for a season. And I think we could add Satan left him bloodied and broken for a season. Jesus won that spiritual conflict. And then verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Most of our fighting takes place on our knees. Most of the spiritual warfare, that's where it goes on. That's where we win or lose the battle. And notice, he talks here about praying for others. It's a sign that we're growing in Christ when the majority of our prayers are focused on others and their needs rather than just focused on ourselves and our needs and our problems. We all need to pray and we all need to be prayed for. As Paul demonstrates, he solicits prayer himself. Look in verse 19. And for me that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. This is so important. He said, look, pray that I'll have the right words and that I'll deliver them in the right way. Even the great apostle Paul solicited the prayers of others. Friend, we all need to pray and we need to be prayed for. And I want to come back to that, but let's, let's read his closing statements. Verse 21, but that you may also know my affairs and how I'm doing. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Now let's back up to verse 18. He's talking about this, this spiritual conflict and he said, that we need to pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance as we make supplication for the saints. Perseverance, we need to stay with it. But when he said, stay watchful. In other words, be, be attentive and, and listen because the Holy Spirit will show you people that need prayer. There are people, there is someone in your world right now that desperately needs prayer. Someone in your family, someone in your neighborhood, someone where you work, friend, maybe even an enemy, or somebody in your world that needs prayer. And we're encouraged to be watchful, to be alert, to listen for the Holy Spirit to guide us as we pray for others. Stay tuned at the end of the program today for a special inspirational thought from Bayless. Well, my friend, here we are, you and me. If I could, honestly, if I could, I'd walk into your living room right now or into your kitchen, sit down and have a cup of tea with you, maybe enjoy a biscuit and just talk. Maybe grab hands and pray with you if you've got some needs in your life, but I, I can't do that. Um, because I'm here and you're there. So this is sort of the next best thing. This is my next best way to try and touch you and help you and, and, and leave you with a message. The message is this, there's a God in heaven that knows your name. You are very special to him. You are not forgotten. You're not some number on an endless list to him. He knows you intimately and he wants to be involved in your life. And if you will come to him through his son, Jesus Christ, everything can change for you. I'm telling you, everything can change for you. Don't ever forget this. God loves you. He sent his son Jesus to die for your sins to prove it. God bless you.
And now here's Bayless with an inspirational thought you can apply today. Psalm 23 and verse 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know, there's times in this journey that death in one form or another gets so close, it casts its shadow over us. It may be death to your finances. It may be, you know, some illness. It may be some other thing. But you know, the good news, when we're in that valley of the shadow of death, He is with us, and we do not need to fear. And beyond that, if you consider it, you know, a shadow, it's not the reality. It's, it's just a, a facsimile of the reality. Um, you know, if a plane flies over, you see its shadow on the ground, and the shadow might pass right through you, but the shadow can't hurt you. You know, I remember early on when... Uh, you know, we'd started the church and I just started feeling overwhelmed. And for some reason, I got this stuck in my mind that, you know, Bayless, people don't like you. And it wasn't true, but it was sort of a threat to my mind. And I was really struggling with the, the thought of the whole thing. And one night I woke up in the middle of the night with one of those dreams that you just, you know, you're breathing heavy. And, and I just sat bolt upright in bed. And in this dream, I was out in sort of a desert area and there was a sandstorm blowing and all of a sudden something blew against me and then something else and I looked and they were snake skins and a bunch of them were blown against me and they were hitting me coming in the wind and I woke up just breathing hard and I felt like the Lord asked me as I was sitting up in bed after I woke up, have you ever been bitten by a snake skin? Well, actually no, I haven't been. I have been bitten by a real snake when I was a kid but I've never been bitten by a snake skin and you've never been bitten by the shadow of a snake. You can't fear the shadow. He is with you. And some of you right now, trouble may be near enough to cast its shadow. Whatever area of your life you feel threatened, you, you feel like this you know, shadow of darkness has passed over some area of your life, friend, take heart because He is with you. His Spirit is with you and His Word holds the answer to your situation. The Lord is your shepherd. If we're not careful, unforgiveness and strife can cling to our hearts like dirt. It may be a terrible thing that happened to you, but for your own good, <sighs> breathe out forgiveness. Get yourself under the place of God's blessing, forgiveness, and goodness. You can't breathe in God's goodness and His blessing and His forgiveness. <sighs> If you don't breathe out, forgiveness is just the way we're made. In his CD DVD series, Healthy Relationships 101, Bayless Conley shows you how to let go of the tension that keeps you from living a joyful, unburdened life. Learn to resolve conflicts the right way. Order this powerful series today. Just use the information on the screen now. Healthy Relationships 101. For more information and inspiration, visit AnswersBC.org.